بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها المدثر قم فأنذر وربك فكبر وثيابك فطهر والرجز فهجر ولا تمن تستكثر ولربك فاصبر فإذا نقر في وأفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ربي شرح لي صدري وسلي أمري وأحلى العقدة من لساني في قولي نويت تعلم وتعليم وتذكر وتذكير نفع انتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على التماسك في كتاب الله بسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء الهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغاء وشلاء ومرضاته وخربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى Shall we look at the tradition in Sahih al-Bukhari, the tradition of Sunnah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, which inshallah helps, allow us, allows us to conjure up um, an, an, face, an impression of the initial onset of revelation onto the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. On the authority of authorities, Sunnah Aisha, who said true dreams whilst asleep with the first experience the Messenger of God had of revelation, Never did he dream but that it would happen just like the breaking of the dawn. Then seclusion was made beloved to him as he used to seclude himself in Hira cave, shedding impurities which is to worship for nights on end before returning back to his family. So we said that this is going to take place from the 38th birthday of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hubiba ilayhi al-Khalwa, as Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says that Khalwa or seclusion was made beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahih Wa Sallama and he took to a cave that is known as the cave of Hira, Hira, the Hira cave and that cave was first worshipped in by the grandfather of his of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallama whose name is Shaybat Al-Hamd or Abdul Muttalib Abdul Muttalib is the first one to worship inside of the cave of Hira and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallama is going to continue the tradition of his grandfather by seeking Hira out for worship and the word that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha uses is yatahanna, yatahanna. And we said yatahanna, here it gives us some type of, um, or sheds clarity on the, on the type of way that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was undergoing. One, hinth is like an oath in the Arabic language, like as used in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, hinth al a mighty oath. So the Prophet Sallallahu would what would take covenants with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala with regards to what acts of worship. That is similar to what still remains inside of the Sharia, which you find inside the law, the book of the books of jurisprudence, what's called nadar or nudur. Nadar or nudur are oaths that the believer can make which he must fulfill, and the fulfillment of a nadar is wajib. So many of the ulama are going to use the chapter of nudur in order to stipulate upon themselves acts of worship because if an act as an example is sunnah, as an example tarawih, as an example the rawatib that you pray and just prior to praying them the rawatib you make another to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're going to pray this specific ratifa as an example the two before fajr just before you pray your two before fajr you make an oath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're going to make these two rakats before fajr then two rakats are no longer sunnah mu'akkada they become wajib so therefore the reward is greater. So many of the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's one of the ways they will approach worship. So they get the most out of worship, okay, by rendering their worship nudur. But they're very careful not to make it bil bu'ad. I, I make an oath that I'm always going to pray my sunan. Because you can get into problems then. Because if you don't fulfill the sunan, then therefore you have expiation. You have expiation of them oaths. Okay, but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Hira, yatahanna sallallahu alayhi wa wa sallam. Also, yatahanna means in degrees to shed hinf, which also looks at impurities. Okay, and as the Prophet sallallahu is pure, uh, is pure sallallahu alaihi and the more so he is showing us the nature of how impurities are shed inside of the religion. Okay, so which is to worship for night on end before returning back to his family. He would t- make the necessary preparations for this. Thereafter, returning back to Khadija and immediately making the necessary preparations for the like. I, the only reason he would come back to Mecca was what? In order to stock up once again, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahi wa sallam. And we mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was renouncing the world, it was clearly an act of renunciation of the world, that he would not stock up in order to, what, to maintain the world inside of the, what, the comfort of Hira, 
but that provisions that he would take وسلمه, is in order to show the likes of us that were we to undergo such a lofty and noble act then that ordinarily we should seek the means seek the means i.e. that we should what, ensure that we are not in the cave but thinking about the world okay the ultimate objective is to what to leave the world and to what leave it behind in terms of heart and mind also so the prophet sallallahu would take him he said ordinarily that the the provision that he would take to Hira, the Prophet Islam would maintain his sustenance of what? Of the downtrodden and the marginalized inside of Meccan society. That they would still follow the Prophet because he was one to support them. Which is going to be one of the great reasons why we're going to see that the initial sort of flood of the believers inside of Mecca, whether they're there of those who pronounce their Islam, declare their Islam, or those who hide their Islam are from the downtrodden. Okay, the downtrodden. Okay, and we'll see it in a chapter which, which relates to that. He would make the necessary preparations. This continued until the real Al Haq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hattara al Haq. Okay, and that's what that's the statement of Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Okay? That can be men, that can be what interpreted in many ways. The most generic way, Jahul Haq, Aisha anha says, Jahul Haq could just literally mean the truth until the truth came unto the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which is the most generic way of what interpreting that but obviously the real, like many of the ulama uh, they have names that they prefer for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala prefer yani when they speak inside of religious disciplines when you look inside the discipline of spirituality as an example that the name they prefer for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala over all of his names is Al-Haq so when you read the books of Ibn Atayl al-Iskandri, you read the books of al-Shadri or al-Dasuqi, or the Imams that you read al-Haddad radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een, that the name they refer to, Allah as of the names of Allah ta'ala they refer to over and above, Allah is al-Haq jalla fil ula So here the interpretation that they give, they learn for hatta ja'ahu al-Haq, that al-Haq means the experience of the divine. That this is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam experiencing the divine inside of the dream state. Inside, inside of the real, the real wake state, okay, the divine, i.e. the revelation of the divine. Why? Because here we're speaking about the Qur'an, as we'll make mention of. And the belief of the people of Sunnah wal Jama'ah is when you speak about the Qur'an, you're speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the Qur'an is sifa min sifati la. It's an attribute of the attributes of Allah jalla fil ula. And anybody who believes the Qur'an is not, it's from the people of Bid'ah. That's what the likes of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal and others were imprisoned and tortured over. And that's how he gets his great name, the Imam of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, because he resisted what the belief of the people of what? Of innovation in saying that the Quran was makhluq, the Quran was created, it had a beginning, if not an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that which the ulama have concurred upon is the Quran, it's the attribute of Allah jalla fil ula, it is pre eternal, it has no beginning. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, haq his engagement or experience of the Qur'an in the real sense is what tantamount to the experience or, or the engagement of Allah Jalla fil ula Okay, the angel, the angel in question here is whom? Is angel Jibreel alayhi salam. We mentioned Jibreel is the greatest of all of the archangels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala has angels and his angels are more numerous than any creation, any of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. And that the Malak, the Malaika, that great realm. Some of the ulama have made mention of that the likes of the the, 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 the stars, the orbits inside of the stars. They've been mentioned of tradition, Allah Ta'ala, Allah knows how strong the traditions are, that every single orbit in the heavens is min mahbat min ma, it's from the the, um, the resting place of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's angels, every single orbit. And when we consider that we're speaking about what? 10 billion times 10 billion on base estimate, estimation of modern war, of modern science. We're speaking about a lot of creatures there. And that's just the malaika, that what, as an individual malak, as one single angel that resides upon any single planet. Never mind the Prophet ﷺ informed us that there's not a single drop that falls from the heavens. Or he mentioned that there's not a single tree, a leaf that falls from the tree, except that it's an angel that will what, bring down that, what, that drop of water or that leaf back down to earth. Never mind that a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu with the great angel who's at the great river, primordial river, that it lies beneath the arsh of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, the throne of Allah Ta'ala, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi says, when the angel submerges himself in this river and comes forth and shakes himself off, that for every single drop of water that comes from him, a new angel is born. 
Uh, the angels that only Allah knows the number of his soldiers when we look at what the interpretation like Ibn Kathir, like Sul Qurtubi, like Sul Razi radiallahu ta'ala anhum he's saying that here the Junood are the angels of Allah ta'ala and their number is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's by far the most numerous of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, the angels but at the top of that hierarchy is the Archangel Gabriel you see the one Allah ta'ala calls him Shadeed al Quwa. Jibra'il. Jibr is what is, is subjugation power. Il is Allah. Is Allah. This is what the powerful one from God. Allah Ta'ala in the Quran calls him Shadeed al Quwa, the one of extreme powers. Plural. Gabriel, the mighty archangel Gabriel. And the powers of Gabriel were demonstrated upon the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and he informed the Prophet وسلم, to read or to recite. Or can we mention the various interpretations of that? If you look at in the most applicable sense of the Prophet وسلم, without going into, into higher metaphysics, we would consider this to be to recite. Because the Prophet وسلم, is being informed to recite, not to read. Because he's a Nabil Ummi. Okay, he is the what, illiterate, quote unquote, or the oral prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallam and he sent amongst an oro people who were the ba'atha fil ummiyina rasula Allah Ta'ala is the one who sent amongst an oro nation people who are not versed in what? in reading and writing he meant sent a messenger unto them okay so this is an oral society with an oro prophet so he's not being instructed to read because after the fact he still cannot read Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallam so it's as if Gabriel has wasted his time I mean we really like to understand a sharh Somebody who believes that it's to read, let us sort of comment on what does that mean. It sort of makes no sense in the context of the Messenger of Allah or the society. As opposed to recite, that makes absolute sense. Because he is a prophet that recites and the Quran, the book that he's given, if we were to translate the Quran we made mention of, if we were, the Imams divide upon whether it's what, whether the Quran is murtajal, the Quran is a word linguistically that has no uh, etymology, or whether it does have some type of etymological basis. And for those it's split, you know, Imam Abdurrahman Sayyuti and others bring the discourse, that what well, those who believe that it is, how would we translate it? The recital, Al-Quran. That's what it would mean, the recital, that which is recited. He said, so he took hold of me and squeezed me until I reached the point of no return. Then he released me. He then said, recite. I replied, what shall I recite? So he took hold of me and squeezed me a second time until I reached the point of no return. Then he released me. He then said, recite. I, re I replied, what shall I recite? So he took hold of me, squeezed me a third time. Then he released me. So the word iqra, recite. Wa ma'ana biqari. Ma'ana biqari. As he said, this the... This, the, the the, the power of the Arabic language, those who say it says read, ma'ana biqari would mean that yani, I am not a reader, I am not of those who read. Okay? Or if it's recite, iqra, recite, ma'ana biqari, this ma is not negation, it's not nafiyah, but it's what you call istifhamiyah. What shall I recite? What shall I recite? And that's how it's been chosen, to, that's why I've been chosen to translate it in that manner here. And then Jibreel alayhi salam instructs the Prophet sallallahu alayhi recite the name of your Lord who created, created man from a zygote, recite, and your Lord is most generous, the one who taught by the pen, taught man that he was that which he was ignorant of. So he immediately returned back to here, i.e. Khadija with his heart pounding, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, entering upon Khadija, the daughter of Khuwailid. This is Khadija bin Khuwailid, and she is what? One of the greatest people inside of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, period. This is the wife that the Prophet ﷺ married. And when he married that wife, he married no other. For 25 years, the Prophet ﷺ was in a strict monogamous relationship with what? Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. We said that this is by far the most beloved of all of his wives. The Prophet ﷺ, they're going to differ on the amount of wives that the Prophet ﷺ has. Uh, most of the people of Sirah have it that the Prophet ﷺ married over 20 over 20 different wives, although he was only ever married to nine simultaneously. Others died, others divorced, etc. But nine simultaneously. But when he was married to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, he was married to no other. And as we said, etymologically, the word Khadij means what? It means the missing rib in a man. Either Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, it's as if she was the real other half of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says that, ma ghiratu ala ahadin. That I was never jealous of every, anybody the way I was jealous of whom Sayyidina Khadija al-Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha. The Prophet sallallahu displayed immense love and devotion to her during her life. In the year in which she dies, which we'll look at, it's named the year of grief. 
the great grief of the Prophet ﷺ because she dies, and his great uncle Abu Talib also dies in the tenth year of the Hijrah. Saying that the Prophet ﷺ, when he was given any type of charity, would always ensure that those who used to visit him during the days of Khadija would get a portion of. And Aisha would witness this. The Prophet ﷺ, if he'd hear a voice that was to sound similar to the sound of Khadija, it would allow him to reminisce, as on one occasion in the Sahih, when he hears the voice of whom Khadija's sister. It's way after her death. And the Prophet Sallallahu begins to what? Think about Khadija. We mentioned also on the great what um, the great um, Fath Mecca in the conquest of Mecca when the Prophet Sallallahu is being what requested to go and stay in the great houses of the nobles of the Quraysh. And the great Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum inside of the Quraysh, the likes of his, his uncle Abbas, the likes of his, his cousin Abu Sufyan, the likes of whom Um Hani, the sister of Ali ibn Abi Talib, where he, the house he initially enters and washes on. But when they say, well, where are you going to reside, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He said, pitch me a tent at the grave of Khadija. Prophet in Fatha Mecca, he lives in a tent besides the actual grave of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. That Khadija is, in the Hadith of Sahih, is one of the four poor perfect women that have ever lived. Khadija al-Kubra, four perfect women. But the greatest of them women, the ulama debate between Fatima Zahra al-Batul and between Maryam, the mother of Jesus, alayhi wa salam. Now those two, there's a difference of opinion in terms of our tradition, who's the greatest of them. With the majority of the ulama favoring Fatima Zahra al-Batul, based upon the hadith of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa Fatima bid'atu minni, that Fatima is a piece of me. She's a piece of my flesh. She's physically part of me. Fatima Zahra al-Batul is one of those who was what we call in English a dead ringer for the Prophet Sallallahu Very few people had that. Yani, if you saw them, it's as if you're looking at the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi He mentioned eight people in the books. Eight people looked just like the Messenger. The only woman was Fatima Zahra al-Batul. But she also had the addition additional um, great sort of um, attribute in that she had the characteristics of the messenger also. And she resembled him inwardly and outwardly, radiallahu ta'ala anha ajma'i, deeply attached to her father. That's why she dies six months after what the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam dies out of deep grief. Fatima Zahra al we're talking about a woman just in her late 20s, early 30s when she dies, on difference of opinion. Very young, radiallahu ta'ala anha. In the famous hadith of Aisha, when Aisha was speaking to whom to the Prophet was speaking to Fatima Zahra al Batul and he whispers something in her ear, to which she begins to cry profusely. And then the Prophet وسلمه, he then whispers something in her ear, to which she begins to smile and she's extremely happy. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, I asked Fatima Zahra al Batul, what was it that the Prophet said to you that made you cry? And what was it that he said to you that made you smile? And he said, she said that he said to me that I'm going to die. This year I will die, I'm going to die very soon. So I began to cry, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he whispered in my ear and says, But do not worry, you're the first one to meet me. So you're going to die soon after me, you're going to meet me. So I became extremely happy, she said, Radiallahu ta'ala. And her mother, Fatima Zahra al-Batul's mother, is the great, is the great Khadija to bin Khuwailid, radiallahu ta'ala anha. Okay, Maryam alayhi salam has her own shan. So the difference of opinion is between Fatima and Maryam. Some favored Maryam because some found Maryam is the only woman, alayhi salam, the mother of Jesus, who has ever been said that she was a prophetess. There's been no other woman in the history of Islam who's ever been said that she was a prophet. Okay, Maryam has that. And the verses in the Quran which allude to that, if we talk it literally, although the ulama have settled on something different since then, i.e. that gender and masculinity is a prerequisite for prophecy. But nobody can deny early Islam, the ulama were in debate with regards to that. After, after Maryam and, and Fatima Zahra al-Batul comes, comes Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala, and the third of the perfect women, with the fourth being whom? Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, the wife of Pharaoh. Okay, so the Prophet here immediately turned, returns back to Khadija. And that's really important because I'm sure the Prophet may have many people he could have went to about what this great affair that had what that had what um, that he had just recently experienced. But the one, the great comforter of the Prophet is Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. The one who Allah, Allah the one that we bow and prostrate and sit in front of Jalla al Ula sends salam, sends greetings of peace from beyond time and existence unto Khadija through the great archangel Gabriel himself. Gabriel visits the Prophet on 124,000 occasions. One of those occasions was to tell the Prophet that Allah Yusallam al Khadija, that Allah sends salams to Khadija. I mean, what is that? What type of affair is that? That the Archangel Gabriel descends just to convey salams to you, 
to which Khadija, when she receives it, it's as if it's normal for her. She just retains the salams back to Allah and Gabriel also, because Gabriel also extended his salams to the great lady Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. The Prophet goes back to her and she says, Cover me, cover me, zemmiluni, zemmiluni, dethiruni, dethiruni. From where we get the great surahs, Ya ayyuhal mudathir, Ya ayyuhal muzammil. Okay? Now cover me, cover me. So she covered him until the trepidation subsided. That this is a really traumatic experience that the Prophet Sallallahu underwent. And prophecy is always going to be traumatic. I don't believe that this is the first time he experiences such trauma. But virtually any time prophecy descends upon the Messenger himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is un- he's likewise going to undergo great trauma. So she said, indeed, he said, indeed, I was co- overcome with fear for myself. لَقَدْ خَشِيتُ عَلَى نَفْسِ Fear for myself. عَلَى نَفْسِ so Khadija replied, Nay, by God, God would never humiliate you. Abadan, la yukhzik Allah. Allah Ta'ala would never what, humiliate you. Indeed, why? Because Khadija is mentioning here the nature of the attributes of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what's interesting for us to understand about these attributes, that these are human attributes, they're not prophetic attributes, because these are attributes he is characterized with before the prophetic experience. Okay, it's as if that us as Muslims, that these should be any khalas part and parcel of our reality. These shouldn't be things that we struggle to what to inculcate based upon the dictates of religion. This is based upon the dictates that we are human beings that have been placed in the context of other human beings and other, other, other of Allah Ta'ala's creation. You maintain the bonds of kinship, yani, maintain tasil rahim that the bonds of kinship are always maintained. This is the Prophet Islam before the fact, the experience of prophecy. You carry the bearding of the weak, tahmilul kal, okay, the bearding of the weak, those who are weak, marginalized, oppressed in society, you carry their burden, that what pains them pains you, okay? Likewise also you treat guests, you, you reap unimaginable gain, gain, tuqsib al ma'adum. The ulama say that this hadith al-Bukhari, that it has what, two meanings? It can mean either or, tuqsib al ma'adun, that you reap unimaginable gain, okay? But then, makarim al akhlaq, when we speak about higher virtues of character, and how would that relate to higher virtues of character, to reap unimaginable gain? Because some of the ulama say that that what, because Khadija, remember, 25 years of age, the Prophet Islam goes on a business trip for Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala anha, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi Yani reaped unimaginable gain. The amount of money that he made for Khadija on that trip was unlike the amount of money Khadija had made prior to that. And Khadija was already the most wealthy person inside of Mecca. So we could have that meaning, no, no doubt. But how does that relate to Makarim al akhlaq i.e. why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not humiliate somebody based upon the fact they were brilliant tradesmen, they were good tradesmen, and reap an unimaginable gain? Unless we attached Makarim to that, Virtues that are in that without treachery, without cheating, without humiliating the one you're with. You have to attach other makarim to this. So the also that that's not the case. You see, the world, partaking in the world, is problematic. Even if we look at the great imams of the ummah, look at Sayyidina Suleiman alayhi salam. The Prophet ﷺ said, Prophet Suleiman, hadith sahih, is the last of the prophets to enter into paradise. That's what he said about Prophet Suleiman alayhi salam. Because Allah Ta'ala gave him the dunya. The Prophet Asafa was offered the dunya. He refused it. Blank. Yani khalas. He's the first to enter into paradise. Sallallahu alayhi sahi wa sallam. Then we can take it to the non-prophets like of whom? Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. The Prophet Sallallahu alayhi sallam, he said, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf is the last of the greats to enter into paradise. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf is the most richest of the Sahaba. Yani, 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 what we would call filthy rich, radiallahu ta'ala, and who reaped unimaginable gain. So that he would say about himself, if I were to flip over a rock inside of Medina, I would what be sure I would find gold beneath it. Because of his tawfiq with wealth, he had great success with wealth, great success in trade, radiallahu ta'ala, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. One of the ten guaranteed paradise, but Allah ta'ala delays him uh, into entering into paradise by virtue of what? The amount of wealth that he was, that he got inside of the world. Because Muslims, we have to remind ourselves of this, and we really do have to remind ourselves, especially those who are present inside of this land as what immigrants or sons of immigrants, is that you see immigrants here, we're generally here for, you see, the money, for what economics, is to reap unimaginable gain for whatever reason, and that's shetan, bain akum wa bain Allah, bain Allah, that's our business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
But that is not the nature of the first immigrants, the first community. See, the unimaginable gain they wanted to reap was in the here after, not in the here and now. Okay? So when they come as migrants, it's not to make money. And if money falls in their hands, it's definitely not to keep money. But they are the distributors of the physical as well as the metaphysical. They distribute khair to humanity, metaphysical. And wealth, if it comes into their hands, likewise, they would distribute. Even the great imams like Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, radiallahu ta'ala, in the hadith, a sahih of Sayyidina Aisha, where Aisha is giving a class, the greatest teacher of the Sahaba is our mother Aisha. And she would be given a class inside of her house from beyond the veil, where the great men and women of the tabi'een and the Sahaba would sit in the, war, in the gathering of Aisha from beyond the veil. And then Aisha hears a commotion, huge commotion inside of Medina, Dodja in the Arabic language, like the whole of Medina is shaken. Okay, so Aisha says, what's the commotion? She sends one of her servants, go and find out what is taking place. When the servant returns, it says that there's a caravan, huge caravan of goods has just entered the city of Medina, the like which has never been seen before. Aisha, after the death of the Prophet, Aisha says, to whom belongs the caravan? I mean, the whole city has come out to see this huge caravan of goods. Camels carrying laden with great goods. Who does it belong to? When she returns back, it says it's whom? It's Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. She says, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, the great companion. She says, Summon Abdul Rahman, bring Abdul Rahman to me. So Abdul Rahman ibn Auf comes to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and has sits in front of our mother Aisha. By the time he stands, he's given the entire caravan lillah for the sake of Allah ta'ala. Distributed every last hair of the camel. Every last hair of the camel distributed. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, every last hair of the camel and what what is upon the camel. That's the nature of the people of Allah ta'ala. So as with what reap unimaginable gain, then the issues, as we made mention of, is regards to that type of that interpretation. Tuqsib al ma'adum, also what is al ma'adum here? Al ma'adum means those qad udim fil mujtama'ah. Those who are what? Yani, they do not exist in society. The nobodies in a land. Tuqsib al Ma'adum, which we focus upon here, now not you reap on imaginable gain, but you provide for the nobodies in society. And that is clearly from the Makarim al Akhlaq, and it's clearly from the way of the Prophet. <laughs> since what? Since Tufulati, from his first, yani, earliest years, when anything's inside of his hands, to the day he dies, he provides for what? Those who are nobody in society. And the Prophet would mention many ahadith, Rubba Ash'at Akhbar, Mudfu'an Dhu Tamrain, Mudfu'an Bil Abwab, Lo Aqsama Allah, La Abar. And one of the most famous traditions where he says, Rubba, there are many Ash'at Akhbar, disheveled and dirty people. Dirty, i.e., their skin is dirty. Disheveled, their clothes are dirty. Crease, Dhu Tamrain, only two basic rough coarse garments. Mudfu'an Bil Abwab, they're nobodies. Rejected at the doors of people. Nobody would allow such people into their houses. The Prophet ﷺ said, Lo aqsama ala Allah, were they to make an oath by God. And aqsama ala Allah doesn't mean an oath like qasam, lo qasama ala Allah. He said, aqsama ala Allah means were they to demand anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah a'atini, oh Allah give me. If were they to demand from Allah, la abarrahu. Allah ta'ala would give them whatever they demanded. You see, Shaitan did a fear with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is telling us, be careful. You see, in the tradition of Sahih, that what the angels themselves often come as disheveled, what, and dusty, rejected, nobody, that's how they come, in order to test the believers, that those people that we look down upon, we may be looking down upon the best of Allah ta'ala's creatures in the seen world as human beings, or people who have metamorphosed, beings that have metamorphosized into people, metaphysical angels. Okay, so be careful. And the Prophet sallallahu these were his people. Allahumma ihini. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his famous dua, Oh Allah, yani make me live with the poor. Yani allow me to live as the poor. And he says, wa amitni. Miskina and allow me to die as somebody who's poor, impoverished. Wah shurni fi zumrat al masakin. He says, and raise me in the good company of the poor, the downtrodden. That's our messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And if we want to get a what a striking, really graphic example of this, read the Shama'il. Read the books of a Tirmidhi. Read his, Imam al Tirmidhi Shama'il. Read the various ahadith in Al Bukhari or Muslim. I know your prophet. Know your prophet, and you will understand when you read about your prophet, 
Yani if he was not the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, same type of individual, he would be a nobody. If you want to excuse the expression, that's how we would treat him as somebody who's a nobody, who has nothing in society, rejected from doors. That's how the messenger would have been. You see, when the Quraysh came, and the Prophet, he's the Prophet, they said, Ibn Abi Vib, the son of a shepherd, that nobody, how could he be one, how could he be a Prophet? And Allah Ta'ala literally mentions that in the Quran, if the Quran was supposed to come down on anybody, what about the two great men? Walid ibn al mughira and Urb ibn Masood al thaqafi What about the two great men of the Quraysh and of Abanu Faqif? Why a shepherd? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's important. Why is that important? Because we're Quraysh from back in the day. Because how do we treat those who are most like the Prophet sallallahu in the apparent sense, in the worldly sense? How do we treat them? How? Uh, would we marry? The Prophet sallallahu said, مَدْفُوعًا إِلَى يعني, Would we marry our daughters to such an individual? Nowadays, we stipulate the world and then some, you see, as a dowry for our daughters, a dowry for our sisters, a dowry for whoever. Would you give your daughter to the Prophet sallallahu Would you give your daughter to Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abu Turab, the one who slept upon earth? On earth, the Prophet sallallahu said, call him Abu Turab. Uh, Prophet on marriage didn't have any money for a dowry. In the khutbah of Abu Talib and his, and, his, and his marriage to Khadija, Abu Talib says that what that Muhammad is a man of no money. He doesn't have any money. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is amazing about that? Well, only a month ago he did. He made a great amount of money from Khadija. Where did that money go? Took civil ma'doom. That he was he those who were rejected in society, he supports them. So he comes a month later to his wedding without a bean. So Abu Talib says he doesn't have any world. And he said, I know the world is a fickle and vanishing thing. Famous khutbah, he says. He says, so I marry him from my money. Abu Talib says, he doesn't have no money for his dowry, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. sallam. Yeah, we should think that if someone's going to marry our daughter and they don't have a dowry, is that where it was? Is that where the, what? the criterion lies? Because we would have rejected the messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's Allah, the salam wa alafiyah. You see, shatana baynana wa baynahu. And what you're always going to see, that's what they say in the Arabic language, shatana baynana wa baynahu. How different we are from who he is. How different we are from how they were. Different. And it's whenever you see a generation rise up to the prophetic standard, nusir bihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Victory is granted for them. You see, it's no use crying on television. No use crying in the newspapers. No use all of this political activism. Nonsense. We've had it for how many decades? And where has it got us? It's got us in, in one of the worst periods we're in. Yeah, only 10 years was a lot better. Anyone who's, who's practicing Islam 10 years ago knows it was a lot better 10 years ago. Where does all the ra, 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 Khalifa, ra, 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 all of that type of Islam, where does it got us? When people are buying from the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, shout. If you're upon the plane of Abu Bakr, shout if you're on the plane of Umar, shout if you're on the plane of Uthman or Ali or Fatima or Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in, but uskut, be quiet if you're upon your own plane, a plane which is distant from the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, waslah nafsak, rectify yourself, align yourself with that, bima ja'a bihi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that which he came with. And these are attributes, yalwi, speaking of prophecy, Humanity here, human attributes. How do you treat your family? How do you treat the downtrodden? How do you treat your guests? How do you treat humanity? How? That's the big question. And as far as our record is, it ain't that good, is it? Treat guests well, and you assist in times of truth. And we know that these are not peculiar to the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Hadith in Bukhari also, related by Aisha also, of this time about her father, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that when Abu Bakr was cast out of Mecca, thrown out of Mecca radiallahu ta'ala anha before the great Hijrah, and he once just wandered the earth, wandered the earth, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, he could go off, musibah from the great tribulations of our time, is just this martial battalion against the people of spirituality. Yeah, the people speak about spirituality as if it's not from the deen, not from religion. That is sort of, yeah, gharib. That is madness. 
Yani that when we speak about spirituality, the nature of the great imams of spirituality and what the, their understandings that have been brought forth from the Kitab and the Sunnah, modern Muslim who expects to establish, you see, the meek shall inherit the earth, expects to, expects to establish the religion of Allah Ta'ala upon earth and they bereft of any understanding of spirituality, cave. How could that be? Look, where's, where's Ni'mah Salaf? Where is the great predecessor, Abu Bakr? You see, when Abu Bakr has left Mecca, what does Abu Bakr say? He says, why are you leaving Mecca? He's approached Hadith al-Bukhari. Why are you leaving Mecca? Ibn Dukhanna asked him, the great Sayyid of the, of the Ahbash, of the Bedu, asked him, why are you leaving? What, you're going to go to Abyssinia to establish an Islamic state? What, you're going to go to Europe and <coughs> spread the deen of Islam? What are you going to do? You know what he says? I'm going to wander the earth worshipping God. That's all he says. Uh, that is what you see in the language of Islam. That's what you call a Sufi. That's what a Sufi is. That's what they say in their books. He's going to wander the earth worshipping nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is forced back into Mecca by this Sayyid, by this master of what? Of the, of the Ahbash, of the Bedu. He says, the likes of you are not cast out. The likes of you are not cast out from Mecca. They have no reason to send you out to Mecca. This is a disbeliever speaking. But what did he recognize in Abu Bakr? Human traits, human attributes. What human attributes? The same five mentioned here. The exact same five what? verbatim. He mentions that you are of those who what? maintain ties of kinship. You are of those who what? who carry the burden of the weak. You are of those who quote unquote reap unimaginable gain or what and provide sustain for those who consider nobodies in society. You are of those who treat guests well. You are of those who Allah know whatever haq you assist in times of truth, that you stand in defense of truth. Come back to Mecca, I protect you, he says. This is this is a man of, of, of great armies, of the the, the Bedouin of outer outer layer of, of, of Mecca. And when he goes in front of the Kaaba, in front of the Mela, the senator of the Quraysh, he says the exact same thing. Abu Bakr is not cast out of Mecca. But well, why you say that? Because, mentions the five, and they don't argue. They get the point. Yani, you see, the casting the likes of him out of Mecca is tantamount to an inhumane action. Because this is a true human being. Okay? Where are we in relation to this? So Khadija took him to Warqa ibn Nova ibn Asad ibn Abdul Uzza. Okay, so this is the cousin of, the cousin of Khadija, a great individual. Remember, Khadija is Khadija, the daughter of Khuwailid, the son of Asad. And he is Warqa ibn Nawfal, the son of Asad. So this is the first cousin of what? Of Khadija, Nawfal and Khuwailid are brothers. <laughs> and this individual, he was an individual who attained to Christianity in the period of ignorance. Attained to Christianity, okay? which is really important turn to Christianity in the time of ignorance. He was able to write the Bible, writing the gospel, writing from the gospel, whatever God willed for him to write. What it says is that he could write in Ibraniya. Right? In another way, there's two, there's two. this is in the, in the book of, um, of, of Kayfa Bada al-Wahi in Bukhari. Uh, Bukhari begins, brings this hadith in two versions, one, at least two versions. One of them he brings it in Kayfa Bada al-Wahi, is where we took it from here. How does revelation begin? He also brings it in his chapter, which is about Ta'bir al ruya the interpretation of dreams in Sahih al-Bukhari. Okay, in, in the riwayah it says that Warqa ibn Nawfal could was fluent in writing Hebrew as a Christian, which, lets us, which again that lets us know about the nature of what of Christians being Jews, Judo Christians. So he was able to write the Bible, writing from the gospel, whatever God willed for him to write. He was a very old man who had now gone blind. <clears throat> we said that he was one of the Hunafa. Hunafa were those monotheists that Allah Ta'ala yani, raised before the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> The most famous of them is someone called Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal. He's the, considered the most famous and the greatest of them. And he and Waraka were friends. They were friends. And he and Waraka, Waraka becomes a Christian in the presence of Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal. They meet the last Christians together. They're searching for the primordial way of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And when they meet the last Christians in Arabia, which the Christian world admits the last true Christians were in Arabia, that's in their books, that they all disappeared into Arabia because of what the persecution of the Roman Empire when it wasn't quote-unquote so holy. Okay, so they meet the last Christians in Arabia and that was that Warak ibn Nawfal, he tanassah, he becomes a Christian. Zayd bin Amr says, this is not what I'm looking for. See, it's not this, what I'm looking for. So he leaves, Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal, he leaves, and then he rides his beast, he takes his mount, and then he makes a famous prayer to Allah Ta'ala, saying that, oh Allah, verily I am searching for your religion, 
and I desire to worship you, I have to desire to worship you, but I do not know how to worship you. Fabada and yesjud ala rakibe, and then he begins to prostrate upon his riding beast as the riding beast is moving. This is Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal, the greatest of the Hunafa, and he why he's the father of the great Sa'id ibn Zayd. Sa'id ibn Zayd, who's one of the ten people guaranteed paradise. We're speaking about his father, who never meets the Prophet Sallallahu as a Muslim. I even the Prophet Sallallahu declares prophecy right about now, declares prophecy. Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal is living but he's in what northern Arabia, searching for the primordial way, and he's in Busra, till news reaches him that Muhammad ibn Abdullah has declared he's the prophet at the end of time. When he hears that, he heads down for Arabia, but he's assassinated, he's killed on his way, down for him, down to him, Mecca, killed before he reaches the prophet But he's the great Imam al-Bukhari, has an entire chapter on Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nawfal. And it's Ajib, someone who's not a Sahaba, he's not a Sahabi. An entire chapter dedicated to somebody who what, dies without meeting the Prophet Islam as a prophet, Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal. Okay, the great people in paradise, the Prophet Islam said, Yubath, Yom al Qiyamah, he's raised on the day of judgment, Ummah, as an entire nation by himself. Entire nation. That's how he's raised. Okay, this is what his great friend, Waraqa bin Nawfal, he was a very old man who had now gone blind. So Khadija said to him, O Kuzan, listen to your nephew. And the word nephew, he's not related to the Prophet as such. He's not the direct uncle, but it's the team of a demon. So Waraka said, and directly, obviously, the Qurayshi, so they, they join in that sense. So Waraka, they join a Qusay. That's where the lineage is joined, a Qusay. So Waraka said to him, O nephew, what is it that you have seen? So the Prophet informed him of exactly what he had witnessed. And thus did Waraka say to him, This is the supreme holder of the heavenly secret. What he calls an namus al akbar, an namus al akbar, that that is the supreme hold of the heavenly secret. I Gabriel, you've been visited by Gabriel, sent down to Moses. Why Moses? We said because Musa alayhi salam that he was what after the Prophet alayhi salam, Gabriel never descended upon any other prophet the like of Moses. Okay, and the Prophet's visitations from Gabriel are by far the greatest. After him come Musa alayhi salam. So remember, so here is Waraka as a Christian mentioning Moses, didn't mention Jesus. He should have mentioned Jesus when he's a Christian. Two also, that's the last prophet that has came before the Prophet Muhammad So there must be a reason why he doesn't mention Jesus but mentions Moses. The ulama say in the, in the Sharh of Bukhari, they say because what Moses' the descent of, of the Mus, of Gabriel upon Moses was what? was only the only one that was greater than that was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. Would that I had the virility of root youth, would I still strong? Would that I live to see the day when your people cast you out? Look at the bravery of this individual. See, Muslims are brave, are brave, really brave individuals. There's an individual, mashallah, he comes to me today at Jumu'ah, that he was in the circles, and it was mentioned in one of the circles that was held about an individual called Fudayl ibn Ayyad. Sayyidina Fudayl ibn Ayyad. Fudayl ibn Ayyad, one of the great Imams of the Salaf, huge Imam of the Salaf from the third generation. Really great. Uh, somebody who Allah Ta'ala granted one of the greatest Tawbah repentances in history because he was a killer, a highway robberman, and he was, he, his heart turned, totally turned, as he was in the midst of robbing. Uh, his heart turned, and he became one of the greatest Imams of the time of Malik and Laith and all of them, that third generation, Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu. And he was somebody who had great fear of Allah Ta'ala and aesthetic, and he used to live, he talked about Uzla, Hubbi Bailayhi al Khalwa. And likewise, in the hadith, he took to what seclusion? And he what used to live in the midst of a ma'sada. What's a ma'sada? It's like the jungle that is surrounded by lions. In the midst of a, what, a lion pit. That's what he used to live, surrounded completely by lions. Full day lived in Ayat. So it's problematic if he wanted to visit him. But because he was so great, people, he was sought out. I mean, you, you mentioned great ahadith like the Imams of Laith. I mean, if you study fit, you would have heard them in Shabu Sheikh Ottomac class, the like of whom? Laith bin Sa'id, the likes of Sufyan ibn Uyayna. These are the greatest Imams at the level of Abu Hanifa. Mushahid had their own schools in the informative period of Islam. And they would be carrying Fudayl. He's saying at the Kaaba, Fudayl would be what? Lying with his head in the lap of Uyayna and his feet on the, la- on the, on the, on the laps of Sufyan, of uh, Yani Laith, of Laith. How great he was, like they were like his servants. It's full day living ayad, real great individual. Took to seclusion in the midst of what? Of a, of a forest. So people, because he was great, they would what? Risk their lives. 
just to go and see for Dayan ibn Iyad. Arabia used to be what? Inhabited by lions. The Arabs have over 300 words for lion inside of their language. Tells you that they experience a lot of them. The ancient Arabs used to wrestle them. You know, rites of passage, you had to go out into the, into, the, into, um, into the desert and wrestle with lions. Or you were in a man. That's, that's part of your rites of passage, becoming a man inside of Arabia. So they used to go to Fudail. And, uh, and after they did Fudail, they would sit with Fudail. And then they would leave. But they would come running back quick enough, quick fast. And Fudail said, what brings you back so quickly? They said, lions. I know, Tariq. There's lions out there. We just met a whole heap of lions. Ah, Fudail would walk out of his house. This man, mashallah ta'ala. He would walk out of his house and then the lions would be standing. And he'd walk up to the lions, grab them by their ears and say, Didn't I tell you never to threaten my guests? Didn't I tell you that? And the lions would all just uh, part, leave, never threaten my guests again. Uh, that's the people. And when they said to Sayyidina Fudail ibn Iyad, Okay, Ya Khafakala said, Why does a lion fear you? He, said, he, says, he says, because when we feared Allah, creation feared us. But when you feared creation, ah, then khalas, you were placed in your own predicament. That's the nature of the great individuals. And the hadith in the Sahaba, Safina, Mawla Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa individual called Safina, he's a man. He was really, really strong. They called him Safina, which means the ship. It was a lockup. He could carry great loads upon his back, Safina. Prophet sent him on a mission to the southern, south of Arabia. When he comes out, when they, he comes out from the south of Arabia, they're lost in the midst of the desert. Ma'sada. What happens? All these lions appear. <laughs> what does Safina do? He says, I am Safina, Rasul Rasulillah, the messenger of the messenger of God. We're lost. That's what he says, we're lost. How do we get out of here? Hadith Sahih from Safina. And he said, the lions turned around, motion, and they began to trot. And he just followed the lions with his companions until they what they got out of dodge. That's the nature of the people. And an individual today, so somebody much became Muslim not too long ago. So he heard the story, so he decided to test it to see where his iman is. The beauty of people who become, become Muslim, Allah bless Yani. They just khalas, they hear something, that's it, they gotta be like that. So he says that he, 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 was, he, he, used to, he, he cleans, he's got a, he's got a, um, a mobile um, cleaning firm. So he was out cleaning a car in Liverpool. He said he was cleaning a car, washing a car. And then he's telling me today at Juma, and he says that a, a man comes out. I says, what are you doing? And he says, cleaning cars. And what does it look like I'm doing? He said, in front of my house. He said, oh, it's my job. It's your neighbors. I'm cleaning a car. I've been called out to clean cars, the valet cars. He said, not in front of my car. Move your car. He said, what do you mean? I mean, move. Go clean it somewhere else. He says, no. He said, well, I'm going to give you five minutes. Five minutes or I'm coming out with a dog. You know, Liverpool's famous with his dogs. So he's like, do whatever you want. So he says, like, he says, like, the, the guy goes in and the other guy who's working with him, he says, I'm a Muslim. We don't fear anything. So he says, we don't fear anything. If he comes out with a dog, I'm going for the dog. That's what he, I am going for the dog, is what he says. So he says, five minutes later, you know, in the dog, he comes out with this huge pit bull crossbreed <sighs> comes out and he says I ran straight up to the dog and said me and you now <laughs> me and you let's go right now me and you I'm ready he said I didn't even look at the man I'm threatening the dog and the dog began to cower he said began to cower he said come on me and you to the dog and the dog was just cowering that's what he said just cowering Allah bless him and then he looked at the owner and said, never again threaten me. <laughs> Don't ever try and threaten me with a dog. And the man just moved out the way with a dog. That's belief, isn't it? Mm, that's belief. Allah bless you. Yani. This is waraka. You see, were I to live to the moment when your people cast you out, then wah, khalas, then I would give you victory. As an old man, so the Prophet said, throw me out. Our mukhriji at home, they're going to throw me out. Warqa said, yes, never has a man came with the like of what you have brought, say that he was opposed out of enmity. If I live to see this day of yours, then I will aid and abet you. Warqa died soon after. That's the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. Of the things we make mention of here, which we extrapolate from this hadith, based and foremost, is wilaya. And wilaya is what? Has many meanings. One of the meanings of wilaya is to turn away from something. That's what wilaya means. 
Yeah, men, men yet a well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it in the Quran in a negative sense that the one who turns away, yestebdil, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace you with the people who will not be like you. But the point yet a well is what wella can mean to turn your back upon something. Okay? But here the welly, which whatever you can you could want to call it, it's Quranic and, and a term from the Sunnah, or however you want to translate it, some choose the word saints. Is that the best way Allah Ta'ala Alam it has Catholic um, connotations? Some use the friends of God, the befriended of God, the protected of God, whatever. But the way that Arabic is the word willy, one thing which draws in common, all the willy have in common, is that they turn their back upon everything other than Allah Ta'ala. That's why they're the willy. And by virtue of that, they also have wilaya. What is wilaya? Allah places them inside of His protectorate. Like, what's the word for America? Al Wilayatul Mutahida. That's what you call it. Al Wilayatul Mutahida. The United States. The word for the state is Wilaya in the Arabic language. A protectorate. So Allah places you inside of His protectorate. The word Wili is that Allah Ta'ala also protects. We call it a protectorate because He protects the one who is inside of His haram. Jalla fil ula. Okay, so this is the people of what? Of Wilaya befriending God. And what we make mention of this is because the Prophet Sallallahu before 14 Hira. He is demonstrating the nature of wilaya. How is wilaya attained? Uh, like the likes of Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, he says, purification, la yu'inuka ala dhalika illa uzla. The only thing that can assist you in that is seclusion. You see, if it was good enough for the messenger and his companions, it's good enough for everybody. Sayyidina Hum, Sa'id ibn Abi Waqas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in the Sahih, Sa'id Abi Waqas, said, I was the first man to draw blood in Islam for the sake of Islam. And I was the first man to shoot an arrow for Islam, Sa'ad Nabi Waqar says. When did he draw blood? He said, Ayyam Mecca. In the days of Mecca, when they were radically non-violent, and the Prophet Sallallahu due to the pressure of Quraysh, would instruct the Sahaba to do what he does, hit the hills, hit the hills, and go and worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in seclusion. So the Sahaba ta'ala, would hit the hills of Mecca, the mounts of Mecca, and they would worship Allah Jalla fil Ula. They would sit in the mountains for nights on end, just worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sa'an Abi Waqar says he's worshiping Allah ta'ala. And some of the mushrikeen, they come and they see him worshiping Allah. And they're like, what is this man doing? So they go to Sayyidina Sa'ad as he's worshiping. But he doesn't look to them. And he keeps on worshiping. And they're just bothered by it. Like in the Ibn Dughanna. Ibn Dughanna and Bukhari, they were bothered. Because they saw it as strange. Ibn Dughanna, the hadith we mentioned before in Bukhari with Abu Bakr. When Abu Bakr goes back to his house, he cannot engage in public on the basis of, of, the, of the covenant of Quraysh and Ibn Dughanna. He cannot speak about Islam in public. So Abu Bakr is really intelligent. What does he do in his house, Abu Bakr and Bukhari? In his house, he has a courtyard, okay, like his land, and it's not walled. So what does he do? For Bena Masjid, in Hadith, literally, he builds a mosque. Yani, there's no other mosque in the history of Islam mentioned that was built before the mosque of Abu Bakr in Mecca. In Mecca, built before Quba, he builds a mosque inside of his house, the courtyard, in the courtyard of his house, Abu Bakr. And the mosque likewise has no walls. Then he would worship inside of the mosque. And because the contract said, don't engage the Quraysh in public, because you're going to corrupt them. That's what the Quraysh said, Ibn Dukhanna said, on that condition, he has protection. So Abu Bakr said, okay, I won't go and engage in public. I'll engage from the confines of my own house. So he builds a mosque and worships inside of his house. But what happens? People see him worshiping. They start getting mad, throwing stuff at Abu Bakr and sobbing. Abu Bakr is patient, doesn't move, carries on worshiping, carries on worshiping, carries on worshiping. Until they stop throwing, they stop abusing, and they start to sit and they be dazzled by him. They now get influenced by the serenity of Abu Bakr, the worship of Abu Bakr. And they all begin to crowd around and just look at him. Abu Bakr, and that's when the Quraysh get mad because the very thing they feared was now taking place that the Quraysh, the people of Mecca, were now endearing to Abu Bakr anhu, and endearing to Islam. And that's when they saw Ibn Dughanna once again and says, See, he's broken the contract. And Ibn Dughanna says, Look, you ain't supposed to do this. Abu Bakr says, What? I'm inside my house, that's all it said. Where is you from the confines of your own house? And that's what I'm doing. He says, You're engaged in the public, you're engaged in the public. So either you stop doing that, otherwise I take my protection away from you. He said, Wali Abu Bakr. He says, Allah is my protector. Allah. I take whatever you want to take. Yani. That's Abu Bakr. Saying the Sa'an Abu Waqar, same thing in the mountains. He's worshipping. They see him. Oh, what's this? What's this funny stuff he's doing? 
as if they weren't doing funny stuff. People used to circumambulate the, the Caribbean, running around the Caribbean, naked, <laughs> clapping. Ain't that funny? What type of idiocracy is that? Yeah, you're running around the Caribbean, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> whistling. That's why they say clapping is not from the religion or to whistle. That was the, the worship of the Kuffars around the Kaaba. And here saying the Sa'ad in serenity, and you think, think that's some type of funny or strange way of worshipping Allah Ta'ala. Huh? Sa'ad is not like Abu Bakr. <laughs> when they start golden and making fun of him, yeah, he gets up. He has, I, don't know, I don't know where he got it from, but he must have got it from somewhere. He said, a, a head of a camel, camel's jaw, boom, and cracks the man over the head with the head of a camel, cracks him. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu, why? And breaks his jaw, the blood comes down from his jaw. To the point that he said, I'm the first one to what? To draw blood in Islam. That's in Mecca, when fighting was impermissible. And then he said, I'm the first one to shoot an arrow, when fighting was rendered permissible. He's the first one to fire an arrow for the sake of Allah ta'ala. Sa'id Nabi Waqqas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, one of the ten people who's guaranteed paradise. Point being, they hit the hills. That's the nature of the way of the companions, radiallahu ta'ala anhum. And those companions who were with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, unless we forget, when we think about the companions, how many can we reel off? You see, many of us, if you get past 10, we're good. 20, we're really good. 100, you're a wali, son. You see, you're a saint or what have you. You see, there are 124,000, 124,000 of the companions. Vast majority, ma'doom, unknown. We do not know their names, nor will we ever know their names. You see, it's hidden. That's why even the great Imam of Bible, Ibn Hajj Asqalani, he can only get up to around 40,000. That's where he can get to. Where's your other what? Where's your other 80-odd thousand? 84,000? Uh, where were they? They were out in the outback. Bedu, people who were, who lived in the midst of the Arabian desert. You see, in the natural habitat for what? Religion to flourish inside of the heart of an individual. Know that one cannot truly appreciate the reality of prophecy except the one who experiences the spiritual wayfaring of the people of God and the protected friends of God, exalted be he, through the discipline and purification of the self as well as the cleansing and the cultivation of the heart. You see, because many of us, Islam is merely this. It's just movements we make. You see, it's similar but not the same as yoga one of those other things that we make physical movements, but the mind has not been what cleansed. I were we were we to be asked about the nature of religion intellectually, the nature of this great deed intellectually, we would develop a very very cute stutter because we don't have much to say about religion. We don't have much, and if we were to speak, it would whatever come out all wrong. I wouldn't be religious talk. It'd be make up one's own opinions, not something we took from the Senate, the great transmission. That's problematic. I, it's telling us where is the level of engagement at. The level of engagement, if it's not at the level of the mind, it's at the level of the limbs. Uh, and if it's at the level of the mind, then one can move beyond. What is that? The level of the soul, which is where religion is really at. That's where the companions and the great imams were at. That they re related or engaged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, experienced Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the level of the soul. So then what about the level of the heart, the level of the mind, and the level of the limbs? That's the nature of the great companions. And that can only come about through radical discipline upon the way of the sharia. Ah. Radical discipline. I mean, we're you to look at the companions, and we should. You see, we should, like we mentioned before, Abdullah ibn Uthman. It's usually like a good test. Abdullah ibn Uthman. Who's heard of Abdullah ibn Uthman? Who can tell me about someone called Abdullah ibn Uthman? Abdullah ibn Uthman, we just need one hand. One hand, Abdullah ibn Uthman, sisters. Abdullah ibn Uthman. Okay? Now, this doesn't mean there's anything wrong, but this is a litmus test to know where we are in relation to the biographies. Abdullah ibn Uthman is the most famous companion. His name's Abu Bakr, we mentioned him today. His name is Abdullah ibn Uthman. The fact that we don't know Abdullah ibn Uthman means we haven't read the biography of the Imam himself. We haven't hit the books, we haven't sat with the teachers to know who that great Imam, who we more commonly call Abu Bakr was. But that wasn't the name his father and mother gave him. His name is Abdullah, and his father's name is Uthman ibn Abi Quha, Ab, Ab, uh, Uthman Abu Quhafa. Okay, so the point being is that we know this religion through them great men. And when we speak about religion, we've got to understand who the great men and who the great women were. 
So when we look at Abdullah ibn Uthman as an example, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he's from those who the great imam of spirituality, the tabi'i, the great imam whose father and mother were servants of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu a man who was raised in the very house of prophecy. He said, as a young boy, I used to jump from the roofs of the wives of the, of the messenger of Allah sallallahu wa from house to house. That's his roda. Who is that? Anyone know? Hassan al-Basri, the great Imam Hassan al-Basri. Don't be fooled by the name al-Basri, because he later moves to Basra, but he's born and raised inside the Medina to Munawwara, in the very house of prophecy, Hassan al-Basri. And he's the one who says, Ra'aytu unasan, I saw the people, lo ra'aytahum. Were you to see them, la hasibatuhum majani. You would consider them to be mad people, madmen. The type of things they used to do, like Abu Bakr, Abdullah ibn Uthman, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, for 12 years would place rocks in his mouth mm. just to discipline his tongue. 12 years. You see, that's the imam, the person we can say, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. You see, that's the imam that when the Shia raised their ugly tongue against what? Against the Sunnah, the imams of the Sunnah, like Abu Bakr, how could he speak about Abu Bakr? See, why don't we speak about Abu Bakr? What do we know about the Imam himself, radiallahu ta'ala anhu? And were you to go through any of these companions, you would find them to be radical. And radical, I don't mean radical in terms of the way the, the modern media speaks, but maybe they would be as well. I'm pretty sure if Abu Bakr was here, he'd be considered one of them radicals that maybe the media would speak about. But they were radical by any definition of the term. Radical in terms of the food that they approached. Abu Bakr, radiallahu ta'ala, would eat once, once, what we would call a snack. Every three days, every three days, the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum would go to the toilet once every three days. Can you imagine that? That they know it's a pattern to go relieve themselves once every three days because not much goes in. Radical in terms of food, radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Radical in terms of worship, people would spend the entire night in prayer. Radical in terms of dhikr, Abdullah ibn, 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 Abdullah ibn Umar, Sayyidina Usama ibn Zayn, Udhkur Allah, Hadith al Ahmed, Hatta Yaqul al Nas and the That they would. That's all you just see their tongues moving, like buzz and bees in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People would pray with one verse, Yani, Lillahi ma fi samawati wa ma fi al ard, when to bidu ma fi anfusikum wa tukhbuhu, you are sibukum bihilla. That one verse is Surah al Baqarah, wa yaghfiril man yasha, wa yu'adibu man yasha, wa lo ala kulli shayin qadir. That verse in the Quran, Surah al Baqarah, Abdullah ibn Umar would spend the entire night with that verse, crying to Allah Ta'ala. Look at Umar ibn al Khattab, if you saw a man who had lines etched in his face due to crying, what would you think about that man? That's the great Umar ibn al Khattab, <laughs> lines etched to his face. What would we think about a man who comes to the mosque with what patches upon his clothes? Patches, 12 patches, some of them made out of what? Out of animal skin. What would you think about him? Umar ibn Khattab. That was Umar, radiallahu ta'ala an. One garment patched, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Look at the Prophet sallallahu said, what would we think about a man who, who mends his own sandals? And when he's given a new pair, just a new strap, and he's in prayer, and he says, it distracted me in prayer, get rid of it. Get rid of it, yani. That's the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam. Give me the old strap, I'll mend it, I'll fix it. Yani, khalas, doesn't distract me from my purpose in life. You could go through all of the Sahaba, we mentioned saying Ali bin Abi Talib, sleeping upon the ground, sleeping. You see, we'd be saying, you're, like, you're, yani, you're overdoing it, yani. The deen doesn't need you to go that far. You see, just everything has a right. Even the dunya, ya khi, has a right over you. I mean, how do we try and explain that away? But when you look at the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala, and whom, Radical, because it's that radical renunciation and this radical turning towards the Sharia to Allah. The, the Safina to Nuh, as Imam Malik says, the ark, the ark. He says, Men raki biha, neja, the one who rides upon it is saved, and the one who doesn't, gharik, he says, is drowned. Imam Malik ta'ala and says about the Sharia. So when they ride upon that great ark, who is the one who's saved? Who's the one who's on the ship unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ship of salvation? You see, so when we look at the books, and we give, as an example, go and buy a red book, Discipline in the Soul of Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, translated by Imam Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. Go and buy the book, the red book, it's called Discipline in the Soul, Riyadh al-Tanas, or Kessah al-Shahwatayn, Breaking the Two Desires. Read it from beginning to end, and then just tell me at the end of it what you think about it. Now, he's trying to tell you about how the early people were, how they disciplined themselves, because that radical discipline is necessary for the experience of the real. And that's what the Prophet undergoes in them first two formative years inside of what? Hira. Radical. I mean, he's left his family behind. 
left them behind. He only returns for a day or so just to restock and go back to the hills. That's for two years. Prophecy comes, he engages, sees Khadija, that is visited of Khadija. Then he hits the hills once again. Doesn't stay in the house with Khadija or Waraka. Hits the hills for another five years. He's in the mountains, worshipping in the mountains alongside his companions. Okay? The miraculous experiences of the protected friends are the beginning stages of prophecy. Huh? What they say is, Nihayatul Wilaya, Bidayatul Risala. That the word, that the beginning of Bidayatul Nabuwa, they say, that the end of sainthood. Is the beginning of prophecy and the end of prophecy is the beginning of messengership and messengership has no end okay no end to its degrees okay so the miraculous experiences of the perfect protected friends are the beginning stages of prophecy you see Sheikh Yusuf and Abahani has three volumes about their miraculous experiences you see them the Sahabi mentioned the likes of Safina okay radiallahu ta'ala anhu you can mention the likes of Sayyidina Sa'ad Nabi Waqas and Abu Huraira when they walk, when they reach a great wa a river, a great river, before the great battle of Qadisiyah, the army of the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala, uh, they don't know rivers, they don't know water, they don't really know them. Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab said, I would have beat anybody who rid it, who rid the ocean. They're not people of the water. So to get to it, what can we do here? He said, it's beyond. What shall we do here? They said, move, just let's move, khas. <laughs> let's go into the water. So Abu Huraira released the hadith. Abu Huraira said that we with the army, the entire army with all that it was carrying, hit the water and we begin to walk, ride over water. And that's what they say that Jesus salam, walked upon water. But these, the companions, they rode upon water with horses and provision. And Abu Huraira said the feet, the hooves of the horses never got wet. And we were speaking to each other as we're riding across. That's how natural it was, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who said. Or you can look at the likes of Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, we hear about the great floods that we're experiencing. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala and with Sayyidina Umar ibn As in Egypt, he says that the Nile floods. And every time it floods and takes kills many a person and, and destroys the crops, besides in the, in the fertile land, besides the Nile, that the what the Egyptians, the cops, take it upon themselves, pagan act, type pagan act, to take what, a, a quote unquote, a virgin gate and throw it inside of the Nile in order to appease the Nile. You know, See, that's the hukm jahiliyyah So he writes to Amr al Nas, writes to Amr al Khattab and says, What do we do here? What did you think we should do here? Umar, I'm a khalq. I'm creation of Allah Ta'ala. The Nile is a creation of Allah Ta'ala. Let me just write it a letter. That's a madman, isn't it? And he just writes a letter. Bismillah, I mean, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Khalifa to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he says to the Nile that beside you are the ibad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you rise out of your own volition, then do whatever you want. But if you are beneath the commandment of God, then you better come down, be humble in front of the servants of God. And he says it to Amr ibn al-As, and Amr gets the letter, and he says, when you get the letter, throw it in the Nile. I mean, what would you do? Jimmy throw it in the Nile. Yeah, and many people just rip it up to shreds and put it back in the bin and think of another way to deal with the problem. Maybe everyone move away from the banks of the Nile. Amr ibn Aas, that one, what does he do? He takes it, throws it into the Nile, the letter of Amr ibn Khattab, and the Nile comes down. Yeah, Amr is another one of them madmen, Amr ibn Aas himself, when he gets to, 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 to um, Cairo, he, the Cairo, and they're on the banks, they're on the, on the doors of Ka old Cairo, used to be called Fustat. For start means the citadel, a fortress. That's what it used to be called. That's why in, in modern Cairo, there's the old part which is still to this day called for start. That was the old Cairo. They couldn't penetrate with the armies of Amr ibn As, eh? in the time of Amr ibn Khattab. They couldn't break the city, the capital of Egypt. Okay? So he said, What shall we do? Amr ibn As says, I've got an idea. He said, What is that? He said, You see the boulders we put the rocks on, we fire up the walls to break. That's not working, is it? They built a really good fortress. The only way we put me on it, and just fire me over the wall. You fire me over the wall, and then I'll land, and I'll get there, open the door, we'll get in. That's it. That's my plan. They're like, hey, I'm out. And he, what's all that about? And he says, the only way we're going to get in. He says, if that's the only way, let one of us go. He says, no, no, no. They say, why? He says, because the Prophet Islam told me that I would not die till I conquered Egypt. That's what he said. That's what he says, Islam, that I would not die till I conquered Egypt. If any of you have got that guarantee that you can live beyond this, then khalas. If you don't have it, then it's me. So what did they do? Read how Egypt was, was conquered. They put Amr ibn Aas in this. 
and they fired him <laughs> through the air, over the wall, Amr ibn As lands, safe, doesn't break no bones, fights his way, opens the door, the army enters, that's how they conquer for start. Majaneen, uh, madmen, but it's attachment to the words of the Prophet Muhammad People who were not necessarily interested in the content, they were interested in the speaker. That so long as he said it, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the content had to be true. You see, they never measured it the other way. Okay, the miraculous experience of the protected friends are the beginning stages of prophecy, and that was the initial. That was the and that, and that was the initial state of experience by our prophet when he used to worship in Hira, secluding himself from creation in his sojourn unto God, exalted be He. As Saint Ibrahim says, the sojourn vehibun ila Rabbi. Say it, Deen. I am sojourning unto my Lord; He will guide me in the Quran. And he said, Verily, I'm soldiering unto my Lord, he will guide me on Safat. So whoever practices that way will get a glimpse of prophecy through unveiling and witnessing. Uh, Verily, I know stones that used to give me greetings of peace prior to prophecy. Verily, I know who they are. Hadith Sahih Muslim. That the stones used to speak to the Prophet as he's going up to Hira. Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. He used to walk, greet him. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahibi sallama. Then the trees began to speak to the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallama. And these are all, and then it became the premonitions. That's how it descended to stages. It started out the premonitions. Whatever you would see in the dream state would happen in reality. Okay, the prophecy, many are called, but few are chosen. The prophets, infallible, sagacious. Is that is a javidia? Okay, so we just look at here the prophets. We'll define prophets because the Prophet ﷺ is going through various stages. He's a prophet first and foremost. Then he, what the ulama would say, he displays the characteristics of wilaya up until 40. Then at 40, he's now a prophet clearly with engagement of Gabriel. Then at 43, you see him move into one to the stage of risala. He's granted the risala in the, in the surah. Ya ayyuhal mudaffir qum. Okay, arise and warn. That makes him now a Rasul, a Rasul, a Rasul. Javid, we have how long? Okay. Tayyip. So here, this is the definition of prophets. Definition of prophets. Okay. The prophets, first and foremost, who are they? That they are beings that are infallible. Infallible means they not do not sin. They cannot sin. Not that they don't sin. But they cannot, I, by their very constitution, it's as if they've been crafted in the law. Yani, that anything they do is within the boundaries of the law. That's the nature of the prophets themselves. They're infallible. That's what you call isma. Isma. Okay? And it's in that meaning, it's, in, it's, it's impermissible to ever ask Allah Ta'ala for that. That's what we, our theologians tell us. To ever you do ask Allah for isma, it's impermissible. Because you're asking Allah Ta'ala for that which is impossible. Okay, Allah Ta'ala has only grants that to specific beings and the last of them has lived Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallam But if you ask Allah Ta'ala for isma with a different meaning, isma can also mean يعني, لا عاصم اليوم It means like um, protection Okay, like, to, like, like Sayyidina Nuh says to his son that there's no, uh, there's no asim There's no protection on this day يعني, You don't think you can do it by yourself You either come with me or you don't You believe in me or you don't and the sun chooses not to, and a wave comes between them, and he's of those who's drowned. So infallibility is what is what is has two meanings. One, the inability to sin by your very constitution, that's for prophets. The other meaning is protection that Allah Ta'ala can afford in saving individuals from sin, protection, although they can sin, but Allah Ta'ala to lift that protection. Prophets are different. Sagacious, what's sagacious? Fatin. Sagacious means deep sagacity, okay? Like they're geniuses intellectually. They operate on the highest level of intellect. That's why you see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam If you look at the description of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then he has a very um, big forehead. In the hadith of Hind ibn Abi Hala, Azim al Okay? Talking about the size of his neocortex, as they tell us. The size of the neocortex of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That, that brain which renders us different. different from all of the animal kingdom, without exception, the neocortex, the Prophet Sallallahu was given a, a great one, okay, a great one. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar said the Prophet Sallallahu never did he pass up by anything, even the leaf on a tree, except that he would what? Speak about it. In the, in the chapter of the knowledge of the Prophet Sallallahu he would speak, wala wala haraj. So the Prophets are sagacious, very intelligent beings, 
extremely intelligent, all the prophets, by their innate constitution. Trustworthy, male, he, trustworthy, they're also trustworthy in that they what? They never cheat, okay? They never lie. Prophets cannot lie. And if you ever see anything which alludes to that, then you know it must mean something different. Like Hadith al-Bukhari, Ibrahim, would never lie except on three occasions. It doesn't mean a lie. It means what, would, what could be constituted as a contravention, but it wasn't a contravention. I, you know, when, when, when the king of Egypt asks, who's this woman? Sarah. And Ibrahim understood through his great intelligence that the nature of Egyptian society, that the, a, a man's wife was not sacred, but his sister was. Like a man wouldn't try to approach upon your wife, that was considered bad in Egyptian society, but they would upon your what? Upon your, um, upon your, uh, sorry, they wouldn't try and approach upon your sister, but they would upon your wife. That's how they, that's how they understood it. So when Saint Ibrahim was asked, well, who is this woman? What did he say? Ukhti, it's my sister. This is my sister. It's Sarah, it's my sister. So when the, when the king of Egypt heard this, he left her alone. He had, he had ulterior motives, but he left her alone. Because he wouldn't touch a man's sister, but he would touch a man's wife. So was it a lie by Ibrahim? No, because it's a sister in faith. It's a sister in Islam. That's how it's interpreted. So it may seem to be a contravention, but in reality it's not. You call that a tawriya, like the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, at Badr, at the Battle of Badr, where the, where the, where the Quraysh are, um, are, um, are seeking um, there's, there's reconnaissance. And there's a man who knows where, he's one of the great reconnaissance from the Bedu. He knows exactly where the army of the Quraysh is, exactly where the army of the Prophet Islam is. So the Prophet approaches him with Abu Bakr because he wants reconnaissance shown us to seek reconnaissance. Where's the Quraysh? So he asks, yani, what have you heard about the armies of the Quraysh and the armies of what? Of, of Muhammad It's the Prophet Man didn't know him by face. Uh, he said, what, what have you heard about him? And he says, who are you before I speak to you? Prophet Islam says, you tell me. He says, where are you from? Before I speak to you, he says, you tell me about, the, about what you know about the armies and I'll tell you where I'm from. So the man then begins to describe where the Quraysh are, exactly pinpoints where the Quraysh are, the army of the Quraysh. And then he begins to describe where the army of the Prophet Wasallam is, but the Prophet was right in front of him, so he wasn't that accurate, was he? And then he asked the Prophet Wasallam, and now where are you from? And the Prophet Wasallam says, Ma. He said, Ma. And the man said, Ma. And min Iraq. He said, from Iraq. Ma al Iraq. And Qabila min Iraq is la arifuhum. He thought Ma was a tribe from Iraq. He said, Ma from Iraq. I don't know them. And Ma just means water. But the Prophet ﷺ understood that the man would misconstrue it. That's what's called the Tawriya. He didn't lie. We're all created from water. So it's not a lie, strictly speaking. But the man misconstrued what the Prophet ﷺ meant. That's how the prophets can speak. The prophets can speak in that type of what? In that type of language. Okay? For reasons. And likewise, it also male human beings. We mentioned before that there's difference of opinion, early Islam, but it's what the element of settled on. That are recipients of the revealed law. Prophets, they have a law revealed unto them, what's called wahi, yuha ilay, okay, revelation granted unto them, even though they are not commanded to convey it to their people. Okay, that they do not convey it. This is a critical definition. They are not commanded to convey the law that they've received, revelation that they've received. He was not commanded. Okay, so what's the purpose of what of the, of the prophet? They say a few things. First purpose of the prophet is that the prophet here anchors morality and virtues in society because prophets they affect by behavior more than they affect by words. Okay? So people are guided to prophecy through the actions of prophecy, not through the words of prophecy. That's going to be very important because even when we look at the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi when we look at all of the word traditions, of the spoken traditions of the Prophet Sallallahu you have very few inside of the period of prophecy. Very few. When he speaks about anything in the period of prophecy, that the Sahaba in the period of prophecy, they take from his deeds, take from his action. And even inside of legal theory, Islamic legal theory, usul and fiqhi, that they will tell us that the actions of the prophets are more strong and more emphatic than their words. I were you to ever get a situation where the words are contravened by the acts, which and you can't reconcile what they call Jarabina Ta'arud, you can't rec reconcile between them. Where do you go? You go for the actions of the prophets. Because the prophets. It's their actions 
what, what truly guide humanity. We see this at Hudaybiyah, when the Prophet orders the companions to shave their heads in accordance with the divine commandment to shave their heads, and the companions are in a daze. You see that they have, have been so sort of geared off for entering Mecca, and now they're not going to enter Mecca in, for the sacred rites. The Prophet Sallallahu tells them to go into hill, to not to go into a state of, um, of normality before entering Mecca, and they're in a daze, and he's speaking to them, they don't hear. Um Salama, he goes into his tent, Um Salama says, just do it, Ya Rasulullah. As soon as you do it, khalas. you see see what happens. And Prophet listens to Um Salama, he goes out, he calls the barber, the barber shaves his head, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wa sallama, and then the Sahaba start shaving their heads. <laughs> start shaving their heads. Uh, that's it, they see the action of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and not only did they not only shave their head, but then when they see him shave his head, they all fight over his hair. Oh, they will start fighting over the hair of the Prophet ﷺ. The Hadith is Sahih that the barber was paid in hair. That's how he was paid. The one who shaved his head, he pays him with hair. Sallallahu alaihi And then the Sahaba fought over the rest of the hair, and those who never got a strand of the hair of the Prophet ﷺ began to cut it and give it to others. You see, they could show all of them got a strand of hair on that day of the Messenger Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So these are the nature of the prophets. Obviously, the Rasul is different because the Rasul, the messenger, is commanded to convey. Okay? But where are the Rasuls of the messenger? That we believe that in, in theology, we only have 313 Rasuls. That's all we have, 313 in human history. Yeah, that's the vastly dominant opinion. Hadith of Abu Dhar, others, the traditions, 314, 315. Whenever you take it, it's no more than 315, no less than 313 messengers that have ever been sent to humanity. وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ الرَّسُولَ Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, we never punish a nation until we first send a messenger unto them. So every nation, every people and culture has always received a Rasul. Nabi, there's too many to make mention of. What's the, what's the opinions? 124,000. Another opinion, 224,000. Third opinion, which you say the dominant, like the angels, only Allah knows their number. I beyond 224,000 prophets have been sent to humanity. So when we look at those who've been mentioned, how many do we know of? We only know of 25 of those 313. Uh, that's all we know of. And we don't know of any of the 124,000, 224,000 and counting who have not amongst them 25. We don't know of any of them. Meaning that we know very little about who the prophets were. Uh, too many of them be sent to humanity, okay? Revelation, what is revelation? Wahi. Okay, as so we call wahi, because this is defining what prophets are, so we understand a bit about the Prophet ﷺ. It carries the linguistic signification of news that is conveyed silently and at great speed. Two things: wahi is something that is silent. You're not going to if someone was next to you, you wouldn't hear anything. And the second, at great speed. Okay, so wahi um, signifies, and that's why you will see one of the, one of the beauties of the, of the when they ask the Prophet ﷺ about the different types of revelation that he receives, engagements that he has. One of them he described, which he said, he said it, it's like him, Salsala to Jaros, really like a Salsala to Jaros. He said it's like the ringing of bells. He said that is the most difficult. Until the angel separates himself from me. In Al Bukhari, the hadith. What's important about Salsala to Jaros? That gives us a, what, an indication of the speed of travel of what? Of information. Like any of us who are privy, maybe we're not now, I don't know, internet, you don't hear the sound no more, do you? But in the beginning of the internet, if you hear the transferal of information, what would you hear? That's what Salsalot or Jaros is. Isn't it? What is that? It's the speed of the transfer of information. That's what it is. And that's what the Prophet said 1,500 years ago. That it's like Salsalot or Jaros, the ringing of bells. Speed of the transfer of the information. From whom? Allah Ta'ala to the, the Loh. al mahfuza you see in Hadith Abdullah ibn Abbas. From the great Loh to the first heaven, from the first heaven to Gabriel, from Gabriel to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu That's the pathway of revelation from Allah to the Loh al-Mahfuv, the great tablet in the heavens, beyond the seventh heaven. From the Loh al-Mahfuv, it's brought down to what's called Bayt al-Izza. Bayt al-Izza is, is the great mosque in the first heaven, directly above the Kaaba, in Hadith Abdullah ibn Abbas, in the hands of Kiram and Barar in, in the Quran, the noble, righteous angels, they hold the Quran for 23 years, and Gabriel takes the Quran from the first heaven, 
And so he takes the Quran from the Qiram al Barara and comes down to the Prophet وسلم, in what's called staggered revelation. Prophet called it Tanezul wa Tanzil, the staggered, the staggering of the revelation. Although a Tustari radiallahu ta'ala an also says Abdullah Tustari, he says that also in the first initial descent of the Quran, because what's the issue? That inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr. That verily we revealed it on what laylatul qadr? What's, what did we reveal the Quran? The question is to where was it revealed? Because the vast majority are upon the opinion, vast, vast majority, the Quran wasn't revealed on the laylatul qadr to the Prophet Islam, but it's revealed in this very month in Rabi al-Awwal. Not in, not in Ramadan, and Laylatul Qadr in the, in, the, in, the, in the first year of the Prophet ﷺ, when was it? The 17th of Ramadan. Yeah, and it's, Allah Ta'ala shows it, it's called the, the day of Furqan, it's the same day Badr was. Okay, the 17th of Ramadan. So what, so reveal what on the Laylatul Qadr? Yes, the Quran, but to where was it revealed? Okay, so the ulama said that it was revealed by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala from the Loh to Bayt Al-Izzah on Laylatul Qadr. A Tustari says, from the Loh al Mahfuz ila Qalb al Nabi, to the heart of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on Laylatul Qadr in its entirety. Then it becomes staggered thereafter. Okay? But it's not revealed, doesn't mean Gabriel, what we just engaged, doesn't mean that whatsoever. Okay? Revelation carries the linguistic signification of news that is conveyed silently at great speed according to the sacred law. It connotes God informing his appointed prophets and emissaries of the law which he has entrusted them with. Whether through an angelic intermediary or not, angel can be present as Gabriel ordinarily or even Israfil. So the revelation of the Quran comes through Israfil and not through um, Jibreel or without both of them. Without both of them, Allah Ta'ala can then reveal to the Prophet Sallallahu bi hijab or bi khayr hijab from a veil or what well, without a veil as an Islam Mi'raj. Types of revelation, we've mentioned this and we'll close. The angel coming in the form of the ringing of bells. Who ashad alayh. And this Imam Ibn Khadun in his Muqaddimah, he said that this, this is the most difficult upon the Prophet Sallallahu because here the Prophet Sallallahu Ibn Khadun says that he must come out of body. The great Andalusian Imam Ibn Khadun says he must now, his soul must depart whilst he's awake from his body, his physical body. And he must go into the world of the angels. The Prophet Sallallahu Read the Muqaddimah. And Muqaddimah is a loaded book. They say that's the great, that's the, the book that begins the Western science of sociology. Muqaddimah, the great Andalusian scholar, who's originally from Hadramaut, Ibn Khaldun radiallahu ta'ala, Ibn Khaldun radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he says that this is the, the, diff, the most difficult, Hadith al-Bukhari is the most difficult upon me because he must come out of body. And the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when they saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam undergoing that type of revelation, they would take off their ardia, they take off their rida, their scarves, and they would just cover him. That's what they would do. Just cover the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Cover until what? They saw all the convulsion stop. When they saw him still, then they would what? Remove. Remove it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like one of the munafiqun, one of the munafiqun used to sit in the circles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because he knew he was a munafiq. You see, but not not be the wahid al-amur, as Umar says, we behave with people according to what it seems like. So this individual goes home, and then his stepson hears him speaking bad about the Prophet and he walks says, you're insulting the messenger of Allah And he says, who are you? It's his stepson. And he says, I am going right now to tell the messenger of Allah And he says, go and tell who you like. You see, the messenger of Allah will never believe you because of my position with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he goes, young boy, see the bravery of him goes, this is, the, this is the husband of his mother, goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's at the mosque with his companions, and he says that my stepfather has just insulted you, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet looks at him, and the Sahaba get angry, and they start shouting, you ungrateful boy, a man who has taken you in, and taken your mother in, and he is kept and sustained yourself and your mother, and this is how you speak, you tell lies about him to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi the Prophet Sallallahu is silent, and then the father, the stepfather comes and says, Ya Rasulullah, what did, what did I hear my son is saying? And the Sahaba mentioned, he said, this ungrateful boy, after all I have did for him, I've never did anything to but good, and he comes and tells lies to you, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet is silent, and the Sahaba is scolding this boy, and he's watching what has taken place, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Gabriel, and the Prophet Yafsim, and they say the Prophet goes into the convulsion, that's what you see the tradition. Then he, the Sahaba look at the Prophet, take the shawl, cover him. 
They cover the Prophet and they wait. And now he's getting scared of what's taking place because when the Prophet, when revelation comes, it subsides. The verse uttered is that what? The boy is truthful and you're a liar. And then he goes into his great state of Toba. Toba when he sees what has taken place. Okay, Toba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rendered a young boy innocent and that what the father was a liar that he had of those who was considered from the people of Nifaq. But then he makes good his Islam. That's, that's the cause of his Toba, turning back to Allah Ta'ala. The second to blow divine speech into the depths of the soul. Yenfidhu fi ru'ah. Ru'ah. Ru'ah is the soul. Okay? It's the soul. The Holy Spirit blew into the depths of my soul. Hadith al-Bukhari. Okay? That's the second type. And these, this, what are these different types of revelation? Any of the books which speak about revelation, the great books of, of, of Zarqashi, the great books of, of whom? Imam al Suyuti, they will speak of the different types of revelation the Prophet Sallallahu experienced. Three, to come in the form of a man, speaking unto him. Sometimes the angel assumes the form of a man for me, the Prophet Sallallahu says, speaking unto me such that I am fully cognizant of what he is saying. Okay? But it's like telepathy in the beginning. We see in Surah Al Qiyamah, the Prophet will try to repeat it. And then Allah Ta'ala says, يعني, لتعجل بإن علينا جمعه وقرآنا فإذا قرأنا القرآن فاتبع قرآنا يعني, Don't لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به Don't try to what? Memorize it in that way. This is a different type of word. Uh, the angels will thrust it into what? Into your breast. Just be prepared for it. The visitation of, of the angel during sleep on many occasions, and then God speaks directly unto him, whether in the dream state or whilst fully awake, forms of revelation. On the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar, I asked the Prophet, وسلم, are you aware when revealed unto? He thereby replied, I hear ringing, at which point I fall silent. There is not a single time that I'm revealed unto, except that I think I will die. That's the difficulty of revelation upon the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that's what, we, that's what you saw it online in Hadith al-Bukhari with Aisha. Okay, Tayyib ibn Chani, don't have any questions, we'll finish there, then we'll look at the nature of what the prophecy in the next garden. Don't have any questions, inshaAllah ta'ala.